Hi and welcome back. Now this is the concepts video for the first worksheet that you've completed. So my name is Mark Tyres and what you should have done so far is watched the introductory video. You should have completed your one hour worksheet and you should now be watching this video to find out about some of the concepts that we've covered. Now the idea is you've been working with two really important tools. You've been working with an online code editor and you've been working with a version control system. Now, an online code editor or IDE, Integrated Development Environment, allows you to move your entire workflow onto the cloud. So in other words, you've got no software installed on your computer. And it includes such things as a terminal window, so you can uh, install software and issue commands. Uh, you can browse your files and you can edit your code. So why are we using these particular, this particular approach? Well, more and more stuff has been moved onto the cloud nowadays. And in the past, you would buy an expensive computer, you would download the software, you'd manage your own code, you'd have to back everything up, you'd have to install updates, and so on and so forth. Nowadays, because software is so much more stable and the connections are so much faster to the internet, we can start to use online tools. And as part of this, you may well have a Chromebook. Now in the past, your Chromebook basically allows you to browse open web browser tabs and browse the internet. So if we can provide all the tools you need to use through the web browser, it means that you have to install nothing on your computer except for a modern web browser. In other words, suddenly you can start to do development work on a Chromebox or a Chromebook. And in fact, there are many companies now who are moving their teams away from desktop computers and onto these cloud-based systems. And the idea is to train you and teach you in the best practices to achieve this. So let's get back onto what we've just been doing using Git. So we know the sort of problems, you know, where's my code, what's happened to it, uh, what have my team members done in my project, uh, what, did my last, what did I do last, um, how, do I, how do I get back good code, I've just broken it. And as you can see, Git gives you a range of tools which allows you to answer these particular, these particular problems and resolve these issues. So the idea is we're talking about something called revision control or version control. And what happens is every time you make some changes to your code, which forms a task, you commit those changes to the repository. And every commit you make, you have a little message. So you can look back at what you've done and identify what steps you've taken to do the project. And you can also roll back to previous versions if things go wrong. So why are we doing it? Well, basically we're looking at a free tool uh, which makes your life easier. So, you know, there's no reason why you wouldn't do it. But more importantly, if you're a college or university student, you're not allowed to submit any code that hasn't been, fully, hasn't been fully versioned. So you need to make sure you get into the habit of doing some code, committing the changes. And next, in the next lab, we're going to show you how you can move that, those changes in that repository and those, that code into the cloud so you can share it with your with your academic staff so they can look at your work and market and how you can share it with your, uh, your team members. So the whole premise behind Git is with Git you can work on your code and you can share your code with others and others can work on the code at the same time and it's the idea of distributed development so basically you can have lots of people working on the same code at the same time and Git will manage all those changes to that code. And Git is brilliant, it's completely open source, so you can download it and install it. And as you saw, uh, the editor we use, Codio, already has Git installed. So it's very, very simple to use, and very, very simple to set up. So there's a few concepts you have to understand when you work with Git. And even if you work with other version control systems, Git works in a slightly different way. So the principle is, if you've got your, you, you create a repository, and you check out a folder of files that you can edit, and the repository was that little hidden .git folder which we looked at in the worksheet. And you can edit the files in the folder on your computer. Now when you've made changes to files, you can group those files together and stage them ready for commit. So you might have done lots of, worked on lots of files, you might group some files together, stage them, and then with the add command, and then you can commit those staged files back to the repository. So you can break your work into logical chunks. 
And whenever you're working, if you're not sure what's going on, you can use the status command to monitor the changes and what the current status is of your Git repository. Once you understand this, this workflow, check out, stage and commit, then things become a lot easier to understand. So let's look at commit. So let's imagine we have this, this diagram represents our um, repository. Basically, the repository is organized into branches, like branches on a tree. And when you first create your repository, you're given one branch. And if you commit without changing branch, all the commits happen to this branch. And the branch name is master. And as you commit a file, the head is a, the head is a little label, a little pointer, which attaches itself to the last commit. So after you've done a commit, as you can see, the head moves to the new commit and it's, we stay in the master branch. Another commit, so after two commits, you can see we've now got five commits and the head points to the very latest commit that we've, we've done. And at any point, you can examine your commits using the git log command. Now, the git log, git log command has so many parameters you can use. And in your worksheet, you, haven't, you played around with some of them. In some of them, you can see the different branches in your code. In some of them, you can see abbreviated codes, short messages, and so on. So it's very important that you start to learn how this works. And if you start using this, this git log command all the time, which you should do, you should get into the habit of setting up aliases. Remember the log1 alias we set up, which ran that hugely complicated log command. So you know, use git log and git status to monitor your repository. Okay, so we've looked at basic commits and how we monitor what's going on. Now, there's a general rule of thumb which says that the master branch should always contain stable code. So what happens if you're working on a new feature which isn't complete or hasn't been tested? Or you find a bug and you're trying to fix the bug and when you're fixing the bug, you might introduce break, you might break code as you're doing it. What we do is we add a new branch to the repository and we do all the messing around and the unstable code in a separate branch and then when we've got everything working we can merge those changes back into the master branch. So as you can see look we've I've used the git branch command and I've created a new branch but as you can see the head is still pointing to the master branch and if we use the git branch command you can see it lists the branches that are in my repository. What we have to do now, we have to check out the new branch. At that point, if I start making commits to my code, the commits will now be, you can see, to the new branch. Okay, now, so I've committed a new, a new, a new, um, I've committed a new block of code, it's committed to the bug branch. So let's imagine now I want to, I've fixed the bug, I want to merge those changes back into the master branch. The first thing I have to do is check out the master branch. That's the first thing, because you merge branches into a branch, so you have to be in the branch you're merging into. So I check out the master, and then I merge the second branch, the bug three branch, into the master. And you can see that you've got this sort of branch that comes out and goes back in again. But be aware that if there's been no commits on the master branch, what it will do, it will just get rid of that B to E link and just push those extra two commits in line into the master branch. So if it looks a bit weird, a bit different when you look at the commits, that's what's happening. And of course, if I now make commits, I'm committing back on the master branch. So let's look at something called tags. And the idea is tags are little labels that you attach to particular commits in your code. Um, the, the classic example is, let's imagine you, you've got a nice stable set of code and you want to call it version 1.0. Well, you can put a, um, a tag on your, on your commit called version 1.0 and that becomes a release version for your code. There's two sorts of tags, there's lightweight tags and there's annotated tags. Uh, the lightweight ones are really just temporary labels to help you understand what's going on. The annotated are what we're most interested in. And there's two things you can do with, with tags. You can attach a tag to the current commit, in other words, where the head is, or you can specify a short uh, commit code and attach a tag to any commit that you want to. And obviously you can list all the tags. Okay, we're looking at something called uh, ignore files now. 
Now, this is where you can tell Git to ignore certain sorts of files. So let's imagine you're working in Python. When you create a PyPython file, when you run it, it creates a, an executable, a PYC file. Well, really, that PYC file shouldn't be in the repository. It's a binary file, it's built out of the Python file. So you add it to your git ignore file. Now, if you look at this ignore file, you can see I'm ignoring any file that ends in .com. I'm ignoring anything at the modules folder with anything inside the modules folder. And I'm also ignoring a file called temp.md. So you can see that I can, be, I can choose put wildcards in, I can choose particular file names or exclude entire folders. And if you're working with third-party libraries, it doesn't make sense for you to have a copy of their library in your repository. You might as well use, you know, use the library when you want it. Okay, something goes wrong. We want to, let's imagine you've put some files in you, you didn't mean to put into the staging area. Remember, git commit dot puts everything in. If you want to take all the files out of the staging area, you can use git reset, or you can pass it a file name and it will just take that one file name out of the staging area. Always a good idea to use git status to check what's in the staging area and what's not. Okay, the classic example is let's imagine that you have um, committed good code and you've started to make some changes to your code and suddenly it all breaks and you can't get it working again. If you use the git reset hard command, it will revert all your code back to what it was like the last time you committed. So it's an undo button that takes you back to the last commit. So it's a very good idea every time you get working code to always commit it and bank those changes. And what will happen is the folders and files in your working directory will change to what they were like when you did last commit. Um, on a sort of little bit of a side here, there's a wonderful diff command. You can pass it two codes, two short commit codes, and it will tell you what the differences are between those two versions of the same file. So pluses indicate additions to the file, minus signs indicate stuff's been taken away, and you can see what changes have taken place. Now, renaming files. We did this in the worksheet. The problem you have, if you rename a file just by you know, right-clicking and renaming, What's going to happen is Git will think you've deleted the file with all its commits history and you've created a new file which won't have any commit history at all. So it's very important when you, if you want to rename a file or move a folder, you use the git mv command. Otherwise you lose all that wonderful rich commit history that you built up. And if you go to git status and it says file deleted, it means you've accidentally used the wrong way of doing it. If it says renamed, you've done it the correct way. Now, this is quite nice. If you want to, let's imagine that you have, um, you've, you've, you've committed some stable code, you've then made some changes and committed it, you've committed it and you've realized you've gone wrong. Wouldn't it be nice to go back to the good version of the code so you can work on the good version of the code? Well, you can. And there's three steps involved. So here's my current code, here's my commits, and you can see uh, I've got two commits. The third commit was my last good commit, and then I've committed two bad commits. That's with the red circles around them. So my master branch now has bad code. I want to rewind back to that green circle, that green commit. Now, the trick is you don't remove any commits. Those bad commits will be there, but they won't be part of the master branch. So the first thing you have to do is you have to rename the master branch and give it a different name. So I've, I've called my master this branch bad code. So my branch is now called bad code and not master. Now what I do is I check out the correct commit, the one I know is going to work. But as you can see, everything's kind of floating at the moment. There's no, this commit hasn't got its own, um, its own branch name. So the final step is I create a, I, I rename, I add the branch name master to that commit. So as you can see now, I've got two branches. And when I commit my next bit of code, it gets committed to the master branch, which is the good, based on the good code. And the old code sits there in the siding, 
and doesn't get in anybody's way, but I can look back at it if I want to see what went wrong. Okay, now final thing to look at is books. Um, obviously Git is a huge subject and we're going to carry on with it next week in next week's lab, but if you want a reference book, the Pocket Guide is excellent. It's a nice little skinny book which you can carry around with you. There's plenty of cheat sheets, cheat sheets out there on the internet. If you want to know the ins and outs and the nuts and bolts of Git, I recommend a version control with Git, the bat book, the big bat book, as a really good book to look at. Okay, thanks for watching. Your next challenge, your next thing to do is to watch the introductory video to the second lab. And after that you can, and that's it. So uh, until next time, good luck.